Hello and welcome to Wilmington Biz Talk presented by the Greater Wilmington Business Journal. Today we're talking to state legislators about um, who represent New Hanover County about the $27.9 billion budget that Governor Roy Cooper recently signed into law and how that impacts the Wilmington area. And we'll also spend some time on some other Wilmington topics um, that the legislators can give us some insight. So um, we are going to welcome with us today is Representative Deb Butler, Democrat from New Hanover County, Republican Representative Ted Davis, Jr., and Re Republican Senator Michael Lee. Welcome for, um, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and welcome. You're welcome, Cece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to do it. Okay, so my first question is in regards to the budget. And I wanted to ask you, what is one thing that you would change with regard to this year's budget? And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go in alphabetical order for this one. So I'm gonna start with you, Representative Butler. Well, certainly I would have done better by our teachers, CC. You know, we are under a judicial mandate to provide every child in North Carolina sound basic education. In fact, our constitution requires that. And while we did make some good investments in education, they fell far short of the mark. We didn't give our teachers a substantial enough pay increase, in my opinion. We didn't provide for master's pay, which I would have supported. We didn't provide for cost of living increases as we should have. We didn't provide for teaching fellows and we didn't invest robustly enough in infrastructure. So that's one thing that I would have um, made a bigger investment in. Okay, how about you, Senator? Senator, um, excuse me, Representative Davis. Well, I don't know that I would change anything because I believe that the budget that was passed is uh, responsible and it responds to our current needs and plans for an uncertain economic future. I mean, if you look at the budget, it includes critical investments in education, teacher and state employee raises, infrastructure, economic development, school safety, and water and sewer uh, improvements. So I think it was a good budget and I think it, I don't think I would change anything. Senator Lee, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with uh, Representative Davis. I mean, we, we over the next six years, we're going to have $2.6 billion to be spent on school capital. Over the biennium, I, I mean, we've had, I think it's 6% increase in teacher salaries. It's never enough. We need to do more. But I think we made really good headway in that regard. Um, you know, the infrastructure funding, whether it's locally here, we were provided, I think, over around $20 million for uh, the lower uh, Cape Fear Water Authority for a parallel line for, for water. I mean, there are a lot of really good things in here. If I had to choose one thing that I, I wish we could have gotten a little more funding into, it's probably the, the education savings accounts for children with disabilities. We really thought we were able to get uh, the wait list eliminated so that those children with disabilities would have uh, opportunities that they don't currently have in the traditional public school system. Um, I wish we could have done a little more there. So hopefully we'll catch up uh, in the next budget cycle. And why is that particular point important to you, Senator Lee? Well, I think there are a lot of times where children with disabilities don't have the adequate services that are tailored to their needs in the traditional public school system. Some of that has to do with our, our traditional school system here in North Carolina. A big part of that probably has to do um, with some of the federal regulations that surround children with disabilities. This gives them the flexibility to really tailor um, services to those children and their specific learning um, challenges that they have uh, in the best way possible and gives all parents that opportunity through this particular funding. And we still have a wait list this year. Uh, we thought we were going to be able to clear it, but, but we weren't able to get there. Okay. I wanted to go back, Representative Butler, to what you were saying. You were talking about teacher pay. So if, if I was reading correctly, they'll get an average raise of 4.2% this year. Do you, and you, do you feel like that should have been higher because of inflation and like you said, cost of living? Teachers, uh, teachers will tell you, they're the first ones to say, we're, we're not in this for the, the money, but listen, you've got to be able to provide for your family. And uh, we are gonna have a very, big retention problem. We're not gonna be able to recruit and keep the best and the brightest. In fact, we already know we're suffering from teacher flight. They are going from North Carolina to other places because we don't offer the compensation package. 
We don't provide teaching assistance like we should. We don't give cost of living increases like we should. We don't have master's pay. We don't have those things. And those are important to teachers. So we know that we are gonna have a retention problem if we don't do better by them. And my goodness, did they carry us during the pandemic or what? Under dire circumstances, they performed so admirably. And I think that we need to invest in them and to show them that we appreciate their, their um, commitment to our children. And CC, I'm not sure that a lot of people understand that teachers will receive an average of a 14.2% increase over the biennium, um, if you include bonuses and things like that. Um, you know, one thing that we really focused on this budget, you know, every single year we raise teacher pay uh, as, as a legislature. Now, in years where the budget was vetoed, that didn't come through unless it was um, unless we were able to get through the veto. But something we really wanted to focus on this time is non-certified public school employees um, to get a, either a 4% increase or at least $15 an hour. Those are your school bus drivers and other folks who are not certified because they hadn't seen an increase in quite some time. And a lot of folks aren't talking about that. And, and, and there are a lot of us that are talking about it and really wanted to focus on it in this budget. And that's something we were able to accomplish. And hopefully we'll continue that increase over time. But we really need to think about um, everyone in the, in the traditional public school system uh, as well. If I could add to that, uh, what Michael has talked about, the, there is a, in this last budget, there is a 3.5% pay increase uh, for state employees, I know we're not talking about those, but still it's in there with a 6% increase over the biennium and the 4.2% average pay raise for teachers, which is 9.1% increase over the biennium. Right. Uh, as, as Michael alluded to, the non-certified public school employees like bus drivers are going to get either 4% raise or an increase to $15 an hour, whichever is greater, and there's an additional 1% one-time retiree supplement, which is 4% total over the biennium. So this budget does allow for increases in teacher pay. And, and I must take issue with Representative Butler when she criticizes what has not been done. Every budget that we have presented and uh, has been passed that provide teacher pay, Representative Butler votes against. So I, I really, I have a problem with yeah. someone complaining about teachers not getting pay increase that they think they ought to get that would vote for them to get nothing because what we have done is a whole lot better than not getting nothing at all but I do agree that uh, we do need to be more we have a track record of doing more and we we would definitely do more well and you know in defense of myself you know you can always want for more and when you see that it's insufficient you can talk about percentages all you want to but with inflation and everything the net sum gain is next to nothing and we are nowhere near the national average in teacher pay. In fact, we fall woefully short of that. So teachers are not going to work for, for crumbs. They're going to leave and go other places. And we see it. That's a fact. So I'll leave it at that. And I understand that. But you vote for them to get nothing rather than getting what was provided in the budget. And I, I just find that hard to comprehend with your criticism. But that, that's fine. That's your choice. Well, and that's, why I get, and that's why I get the um, endorsement every year from every teacher organization. So you certainly you do. The Democrat organizations, of course you do. <laughs> of course. I wouldn't Ted. expect otherwise. Okay, Ted. I mean, come on, let's, let's talk straight. Thank you. Well, clearly there obviously, you know, is differing viewpoints there when it comes to um, education and teachers. Um, but obviously everyone you know, it, you, you do seem to be working toward improving the situation overall, it sounds like, um, with this latest budget and then ongoing conversations. Um, it seems like it's um, particular interest in the Wilmington area because I know some teachers, um, and full disclosure, my whole family, they're all teachers. I did not get the teaching gene, but um, they, they all, my sister, my dad, my mom, my grandparents. Anyway, um, I just have heard teachers say, you know, the affordable housing problem is an issue for them here in Wilmington because they end up, in some cases, they, they will end up having to live pretty far away from the schools they teach in. But um, I'm, I'm sure that's part of the whole consideration when you're looking at the funding. Um, so is there anything else you think it would be important to note, particularly for our area when it comes to the budget? 
this year's budget? Well, I'm extremely excited about the funding for the ports. You know, that's our economic engine, you know, and uh, Senator Lee did an awful lot of work on that. And uh, I am very grateful that we were able to put a lot of dollars in uh, investment into our ports. I'm very excited about the funding of Eden Village, which is a, uh, an attempt to uh, attack, you know, chronic homelessness. I'm very excited about the dollars going to the Harrelson Center and to the Arts Council and to, my goodness, UNCW. So, yes, there's a lot to be proud of in this budget. But um, again, we can always do better. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Representative Butler there. You know, a lot of times our nonprofits are really uh, the ones on the front lines that can get services to those who need them in our community much quicker than government ever could. And so a lot of times it's, it's easier to find good nonprofits for funding uh, in line items in the budget. Something else that we did that's incredibly important um, to our area is the water and sewer infrastructure that we have here. Um, as y'all know, we invested as a state 23, I think, and a half million dollars <clears throat> into the lower Cape Fear Water and Sewer Authority. That, that's not the Cape Fear Water and Sewer Authority that we get bills from. Uh, that's the raw water source uh, that, that provides water to a lot of our um, uh, providers, including the CFPUA. Right. Um, and then the $30 million that came in in the last budget uh, for the CFPUA uh, to mitigate a lot of things that are going on down here uh, specific to our area. Yeah, if I could add too, um, the, I know that uh, kind of touching on what Michael said, uh, there was 1.3 million in the budget for seven positions and lab service of, uh, agreements for testing related to PFOS emerging compounds. Right. So I think that was very important because, as you know, uh, we're having quite a problem down here with that. And the fact that the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority and also in Brunswick County uh, Water uh, Utility are having to raise their rates to cover the cost because of the pollution uh, that's been done. So I think that was great that that was uh, in the budget to also help with that. Do you feel like Kimore should cover some of that cost? I introduced a bill. It was late in the session mm -hmm. uh, where really we didn't have adequate time it was late in the session, but DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, came in and asked me if I would sponsor a bill, help them with sponsoring a bill to address that problem. Uh, I did introduce the bill. It would hold anyone, and that would include Comores, but it would include anybody else in the state that does manufacture PFAS that puts it into the water and then it goes into a, a public utility authority or, or, or a water authority that, or a water facility, excuse me, that is providing water for us to drink. Um, I had a hearing on that in my judiciary committee. That I could not believe the pushback that I got. I, I was floored, uh, mainly from businesses that were afraid that if that went through, it might affect their business in a negative uh, stance. So, also, a good point was raised in that, that since it is an environment bill, it should go into the environment committee for a hearing. Uh, and I agreed with that. So re I, we did not take a vote on it in the judiciary. It was just for, hear uh, for, for hearing purposes, discussion. So what happened was uh, I did get it referred to uh, the environment committee in the House. And if it came out of favorable report, then it would go back to judiciary and I, I'd have a vote on it. And unfortunately, we ran out of time. So what I will do uh, if reelected next year, I'll first thing I'll do is introduce that bill again. So then we'll have the full long session to address it, not just the you know the end of the of the short session. But the bill is much more controversial than I would have thought. But I'm not going to give up on it. I'm going to keep fighting for our ratepayers because it's not fair for us to have to pay for what Comores or any other company has done. CC, to that I would add. I put a bill forward two years ago, a polluter pay bill that would have compelled Kimors and those like them to pay for the technology necessary to get these you know, forever chemicals out of our water. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that went straight to the Rules Committee and never got a hearing. And in defense of Representative Davis, lest anyone thinks we can't get along on anything, I think it was very admirable, the bill he put forward, and I was very disappointed at the treatment he received uh, when he did that, because that is what is best for this community. And uh, he, he uh, you know, I was disappointed in the way they treated him. I thought it was very unfair. So there you go, Ted. 
we're even. Yeah. Yeah, and on the Senate side, <clears throat> I mean, I think all of us in southeastern North Carolina, the, the House and the Senate um, delegation members are going to be moving forward with this in January. You know, I, I think that the there are some provisions in the statutes that that should already um, work to provide that Kemmer should have to pay for any and all remediation associated with uh, the releases that they had. And I've talked to some lawyers uh, at the General Assembly and also a DEQ and kind of working through some of those things. Um, so we don't have to wait, but there, there's currently litigation in process, obviously with the Cape for Water and Sewer Authority and others. Um, so we're all working hard uh, down here in a bipartisan way um, to move this forward. It's just one of those things that that takes a, a significant amount of time, unfortunately. But hopefully, when we get to the end of the rainbow, um, we'll be able to get this done. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's one. That's a big topic of you know conversation always here in the area and I appreciate you bringing that up representative davis another um topic i want to ask you about is so the medicaid expansion wasn't in this budget but it sounds like it's going to come back up um with some bipartisan effort maybe if i'm reading correctly um what do you say about that representative butler you know hope springs eternal on this issue with something we've been debating and and uh, bantering about back and forth for for years now, you know, and I'm a big proponent of expanding Medicaid. I, in my opinion, we should have done it years ago. But if we are making progress, and it sounds as though we are, the Speaker of the House has said uh, in public and on the floor that he will entertain that measure, hopefully in December. And um, I'm going to remind him of that as often as necessary, but I, you know, it would be best for, for all of North Carolina. I think hospitals are suffering terribly right now. We know that Novant has had the worst quarter of their life. Uh, the this, this situation at our hospital here locally is no surprise to anyone. The third and the fifth floors having been closed with 100 people in the waiting room, we've got some big challenges. And so expanding Medicaid is going to help not only our hospital, but it's gonna help rural hospitals. And I think it's something that um, we're getting, we're building consensus on that issue. The governor and uh, Republican leadership are talking about it and are very excited about it. And so let's hope that we can um, get it done for the people of North Carolina. Yeah, on the Senate side, we passed a Medicaid expansion bill. Um, and, you know, the, the reason we were able to accomplish this, I think this time, uh, as opposed to years ago, is we've we've transformed Medicaid from a fee-for-service fee model to a capitated model, um, which is kind of a managed care type program. Um, we've tried other things in the past that didn't seem to work to expand uh, healthcare to, to those who need it. And these are, you know, I think it's about 600,000 people that are in this healthcare um, gap. Uh, they, they make too much um, in some instances or too little. And so we've got a gap right there in the middle uh, where they can't qualify for the current Medicaid and they can't qualify for the exchange. And so this was really hopefully capture all of those folks um, who are currently working and just can't afford um, health insurance and just make a little too much because they're working uh, to be on traditional Medicaid. So so hopefully we'll be able to revive this. Um, it would be great if we do it this year because there are some incentives with the federal government, but certainly uh, by the next session. You know, this, this Medicaid uh, issue, it, it was really, to me, it was very interesting. Uh, as Senator Lee said, the Senate did pass uh, a Medicaid expansion bill, but the problem with that bill was, is that it also included certificate of need changes and it also included the SAFE Act, which would allow nurses and, and other providers like that to act without supervision from doctors. All three of those, Medicaid, Certificate of Need, and SAFE Act, are very controversial. And so when that came over to the House, the House did not have an appetite to try to address all three of those in a bill. Uh, no offense to Senator Lee or the Senate, but if they just sent out a Medicaid bill by itself, it would have gotten far more attention uh, from the House. What the House did, since they weren't going to go along with all three of those things, we passed a bill which basically would say that it was going to turn it over to a committee that was going to be studying the issue and come up with recommendations by December. And as my friend, Representative Butler, alluded to, uh, we would vote on it at that time, whether to accept those recommendations or not. 
the Senate did not pass that. So right now, both of those bills are, are, are not in effect and we're, you know, we're in limbo as far as that's concerned, but I do agree that we're moving towards that. The, the problem is we just got to get the Senate and the House together on how we're going to do it. But I've seen a big change in the overall attitude uh, from the House towards uh, Medicaid expansion. And, and I, 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 if it cannot be done in December because neither one of those bills were passed, then I certainly look at it as uh, the, the discussion being picked up and the long session started in 2023. Yeah, I agree with Representative Davis. If we could have gotten a clean Medicaid bill uh, out of the Senate, that would have been my preference. Um, some of the other provisions of the bill, I've, you know, that are not my favorite pieces of legislation, but um, sometimes we have to include some of those things in order to get it out of the chamber. But uh, I completely agree with Representative Davis. Yeah, there's this old thing, Michael, and you might remember it. Compromise is a good word. It's not a bad word. <laughs> so you don't always get everything you want. And unfortunately, we don't do a good job of that these days. So hopefully, hope springs eternal that in the next biennium, we'll, we'll learn that lesson again. You know, Representative Buck, if I may, that there's an old Rolling Stone song <laughs> that says, you can't always get what you want. But if you try real hard, you just might find you get what you need. <laughs> Are we going to start a rock band, Ted? I'm ready. I'll be the drummer. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Okay, let me turn away from, um, well, sort of from budget matters. I, I want to get you guys' opinion. Um, you know, we're talking here lately more about the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge and the need to replace it. Do you have any insight? Um, you know, there's differing opinions, obviously, a toll or not a toll. Like, what are we going to do? Um, I'll just start. I'll start with you, Senator Lee. Um, what What is your opinion on the matter? Sure. I mean, I think where it well, first kind of where it stands right now, I think that the MPO asked DOT to come back with with alternatives. And, and so I think even as early as last week, DOT came back and they looked at um, how the bridge replacement would fare in prioritization. Looks like it'd be a decade out um, on a straight prioritization. Uh, and, and that's essentially years ago, we took kind of all the discretion and politics out of transportation funding and really put it into this formula. And so that's prioritization is what I'm talking about. Right. They also looked at a conventional tolling. And so that's where DOT um, is able to do the construction and, and manage the tolling. And that looked like it worked. Um, there would have to be some gap funding. Um, but uh, they also looked at a, at a public-private partnership and, and that works as well. And I think that they had a confidential um, discussions previously about that, that I think a lot of folks are aware of. You know, one of the things that we did in the budget this time around that a lot of people really aren't talking about uh, is that we've redirected 2% of sales tax revenue to the highway fund. And this year it's $193 million, but it will increase to, to 6% in 24, 25. And, and so that's going to be at least triple, and that's not even including the, the increases uh, in revenue on sales tax that we're going to receive. So over a period of time, we're, we're going to have a significant amount of additional uh, funding going into the highway fund. And hopefully, you know, that will speed up the prioritization process. <clears throat> so it won't be 10 years. Um, if that's not the case, I think maybe a, a traditional funding model, and we can make up the gap with the additional funds. But uh, we do need to do something. We need to do it quickly. Uh, infrastructure never happens quickly, but we've got to make some decisions very soon because it's going to take years and years to get through um, all of the the fund, all the studies that are going to be necessary to actually start construction. Awesome. You know, one thing I would add to that also is that you know we. We know that this bridge is going to cost in today, today's dollars $400 million. I mean, it's an enormous uh, expense. But the truth is, we are going to have, the estimates are 88,000 trips across that bridge by the year, I think, 2040 or something like that. So it, the, the growth is extraordinary in this region. And the need for that bridge is extraordinary. And so my concern is that if it's not prioritizing high enough, to make it to the top of that list. Maybe there's a problem with our prioritization formula and maybe that needs looking at again. And I would hate to see, I think we need to look as fiduciaries at all possibilities. But for me, a toll would be the last place I'd wanna go because we've seen how that 
is disrupted. That would put so much traffic on the Isabella Holmes Bridge for one thing. Um, so I, I think maybe we need to look at the prioritization formula again because if that project doesn't, if that project doesn't make it, maybe the formula needs um, attention. Yeah, the toll road. My understanding, if you have a toll road, you have to also offer an alternative route uh, mm -hmm. that is not toll. So if you built, built this new bridge and did it as a toll, people like me who are pretty tight will use that alternative route where they don't have to pay the toll and you really won't get your money's worth out of, out of the bridge. Another thing uh, a problem is, is where are you gonna put it? Uh, and also, yeah. you know, buying the easements uh, on the land when you decide where you're gonna go. And as you know, there, there's uh, development over in Brunswick County that are not real wild about that bridge, you know, coming through their development. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a problem as well. So, like Michael said, we, we need it tomorrow rather than later because of uh, all the congestion and, and the traffic flow problems that we have. But there's a lot more to it than just coming up with money per se. You, once again, you've got to look into where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, buying, you know, the right of ways, and all of this stuff doesn't get cheaper, and then all right. of this stuff doesn't get easier to get. So these are things that we also need to be addressing and planning uh, for a bridge that might come out later. Because if we don't get all that stuff handled now, we won't be able to do it. Right, right. Yeah, one one does wonder if you know today's four hundred million and five years from now is going to be a billion. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, so for my last question, I'm gonna ask you guys, what's the um, number one thing, number one concern you're hearing about from your constituents? We'll start with you, Representative Butler. <laughs> well, you know, I think honestly, people are exhausted of politics and the misinformation and the fighting and the vitriol and all of the nonsense. I think people really just want their good life, you know? Remember the days when one parent working in a family could pay the bills? We have less time with the people that we love right now. We're working harder and earning less. We don't feel that our children are safe in school. I mean, these are things that um, are just commonsensical day-to-day -day in and out issues for families. And uh, I think they wanna return to our civil society. They want the ability to discuss issues and get things done in a commonsensical and compromise fashion. And uh, I, I think they are, are sick and tired of the gamesmanship and the jockeying around. They're like, I want my problems solved. And uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. How about you, Representative Davis? Inflation. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really happy. One thing we did not touch on about the budget uh, that was passed, and that is that it does transfer $1 billion into a newly created state inflationary reserve in anticipation of a recession. Well, we're getting in a recession. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, like was alluded to earlier, I mean, people, and I am as well, I mean, the price of gas, the price of food, uh, the price of anything, getting anything, uh, because of all the problems with, uh, um, you know, getting, getting goods delivered here in our area. You also have problems with, jobs, businesses, people can't find, you know, people to work. All these things are tied in together. So I'm really happy about that fund being uh, done in our budget because it, it is good to have a, a safety valve uh, in case we get, you know, in further trouble because of a recession. Okay, and Senator Lee, how about you? Yeah, I mean, the economy, inflation, the cost of, of goods and gas, um, in addition to the $1 billion uh, that Representative Davis mentioned, we've we've put more money into our rainy day reserve balance. I think we've got $4.75 billion. We also created a market reserve of $800 million uh, for state agencies to be able to address, um, you know, the ability to recruit and retain employees. Uh, you know, all these are kind of dovetailed together with respect to the cost of living in the economy. Um, I, I think a lot of this has to do with the policies that are a little outside of our control um, here on the state level. Um, I think a lot of this is resulting from federal policies, but there's some things that we've done on a state level, whether it's um, to, you know, make sure there's no price gouging with um, electric utility rates or 
um, things that we've done with the state income tax um, and things we've done with the gas tax over the years uh, that can help. Um, but I think uh, largely a lot of the inflation has uh, been a little bit out of our control here. So we're just doing what we can. If I could add to that, a lot of times people say, like Senator Lee said, we, we increased our rainy day fund balance to $4.75 billion by the end of this biennium. And people say, well, why, why do you do that? Mm -hmm. I know previously there was a lot of criticism uh, given to us, the General Assembly, by Governor Cooper and the fact that you've got all this money. Why aren't you spending it? You know, we could be spending it on this. We could be spending it on that. And, the, and when we had those hurricanes and those other national uh, natural disasters, we were able to help the people in North Carolina without having to raise taxes or cut services. Why? Because we had that reserve fund. So that's why it's so important uh, that we do keep a good rainy day balance so that if something like that happens in the future, and we're gonna have more hurricanes, we're gonna have more natural disasters, uh, we can have more other uh, occurrences to affect our economy. We will have that money that we can bank on and use once again without having to raise taxes and without uh, having to cut services. So I hope people can understand why it's good to have such a balance, a healthy balance. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all, um, Representatives Davis and Butler and Senator Lee for um, joining us for this discussion today. I appreciate it. And then um, the second thing I'd like to note is that this discussion will be available for viewing on Facebook and on um, podcast platforms like, Sp like Spotify. And there will also be a link to it on uh, the Business Journal's webpage, WilmingtonBiz.com. So thanks again for joining us, and I hope you guys have a great day. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.